All right, um, Graham, you have a, a demo item. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing that. Sure, so this should hopefully be very quick and not particularly too interesting, but I think it has a little bit of potential impact into some of the work we may consider doing in the future. So I thought I'd bring it up anyway. Um, this is not up for review yet, but it's probably gonna be up for review tomorrow or, or maybe tonight. So I'll just start by sharing, um, I think this is the right terminal. Are you seeing just basically a mini cube start prompt there more or less? Yes. Cool. So basically what this demo is about is there's a Kubernetes project that's actually under the Kubernetes special interest groups, uh, special interest groups umbrella called external DNS. And the very short description of it is it's a controller that more or less runs inside your cluster and can look for either CRDs, so full, full resources, or just simple annotations on certain resources and create DNS records for you in you know, whatever DNS system you choose. There's a back, pluggable backends there for all sorts of stuff, including things like Google DNS, Route 53, Cloudflare, Akamai, you know, Power DNS, DNS Mask, all, all of the, the, the backends there. Is it something I've been keeping my eye on for a while um, for us to leverage? I think it's actually be really beneficial for us to leverage. So the demo here is just a very quick overview of it running and doing its thing uh, in a dry run mode. So I'm not actually changing any DNS entries or anything like that. Um, so if you look here, this is just under our, you know, GitLab Helm file. It's just a normal release. Um, if I show you the Helm file itself, you'll see all of this stuff, very boring, nothing exciting at all. There's a chart. Um, available for this um, by Bitnami or somewhere the upstream that I'm just pulling in. I've got my own chart here, which basically wraps around it. So if you look at the requirements that YAML for this chart, you'll see it just wraps around the external DNS chart upstream. And the only thing my chart actually does is uh, creates one secret, which is the password for it. Um, so Fairly simple, not very exciting at all. So what we're going to do now is we want to go Helm file minus e mini cube apply. So it creates a secret, um, pulls the same values that Cloudflare exporter uses essentially, and then just creates this uh, very simple service account um, deployment, which just runs this uh, controller. And, and basically once that goes into our cluster, Well, while we're waiting for that, I may as well let me pull this up as well. I'll show you what, how you would actually utilize this. So if I look at GitLab monitoring, um, if you look at, so this is just our current GitLab monitoring. Let me reduce this a little bit. Um, you'll see here this line down here. So you can see here on the service for Prometheus, I've added a new annotation that's just called, you know, external DNS alpha Kubernetes host name and then just a fully qualified DNS record to create. So this is just Prometheus, GKE, G, Gillies, Minikube, GitLab.net, because this is all just testing. Um, so you, you know, just basically by putting this annotation with whatever DNS record you would like, it will create a, a record pointing to that service. Typically, you wouldn't do this for obviously things like cluster IPs and anything not externally accessible, but for things that you expose by external load balancers, it, you can put the annotation on ingress objects as well. Um, it will basically automatically create that external DNS record for you. Uh, where was this window? Here we go. So our chart's now installed. So if I go kubectl minus n external DNS get pods, you can see here, um, Basically, it spits out a bunch of configuration. The important part here is this is just running in dry run mode. No changes to NES records will be made. You can see here it's looked at every single service we already have across all namespaces, looking for that annotation to say, I need to pick up and do some work. It can't find anything. So what I'm going to do while I'm waiting for that is go back to GitLab monitoring secrets. Probably should have done this earlier. File for the mini cube apply. So I'm going to install the secrets we need. So I'm just installing basically our standard GitLab monitoring Prometheus stack into Minikube. 
But as I pointed out, I've put that extra annotation record on there. Um, and eventually when this installed and run and my poor internet, this might take a little bit of time to actually install this chart. Craig asked if you use suppress secrets. Um, I, I do use a version of a Helm plug of the Helm plugin that runs it by default. So if you use the awesome. latest version of uh, Helm, of Helm, we actually we should upgrade that in CI. Actually, so the suppress secret flag actually disappears altogether in the latest version of Helm diff. Um, but That's really good to know. That's yeah, good. yeah. And it's bad because when you're trying to debug it, there's no way to actually say, actually, I would like to see the secret so I can debug this. So it's kind of, it's a, it's a bad thing in a different way. But um, yeah, because that caught me because I just naturally upgraded the plugin, not thinking about it. And then I just couldn't see secrets anymore. Um, so when this is going to take a while, unfortunately, as it downloads all the Docker containers. Um, so while that's waiting, I can probably talk a little bit about how this is useful. So there's a lot of places currently what we do in our Helm charts and our, and our Helm values where we do, what we do is we create an address in Terraform and we create DNS records in Terraform. And then we have to run G cloud commands in our Helm file to pull that address out. So we can basically make sure that the load balance that we set up in Kubernetes has this, that uses that address, has that same IP. And the only reason we do all that is because Terraform manages our DNS and we want to make sure that when we set up a DNS record, it's going to be correct to the load balancer for GKE. When this service is available in a state where we feel confident in using it, uh, and so I'm just going to stop this here. Um, so you can see here, this record is probably the most interesting to people and then the two ones at the bottom. So basically it's picked up our Prometheus service and it says, I'm going to create an A record Prometheus, GKE, Gillies, McGad, blah, blah, blah. Um, it, they're going to create some serve records as well, but you can see uh, where's the A record in serve. Here we go. A record 172.17.02, which of course is a Minikube internal IP because this is just running a Minikube, but in a real environment, that would be a real IP. So sorry, I kind of interrupted myself there. But yeah, one of the big use cases is we can get rid of all of that clunkiness by having this service available. Whenever we deploy something in Kubernetes and we want it to be made available externally, we just tell it to create a load balancer. And we can also just pop that annotation straight onto those services and it will go into Cloudflare and create the DNS record for us. Now, obviously the big thing with that though is how do you do this safely? You know, if, if this is messing with our real DNS zones, um, you know, how, how, how are we going to make sure this does the right thing? And it's really good. External DNS has a few safety mechanisms built into it specifically to try and solve those problems. Uh, the big ones are, it will not modify any DNS record that already exists. So if it sees something that's already there, it will just say, Hey, I'm not going to touch this. This doesn't look like it's managed by me and just log out. The other thing it does that when it creates a new record, it creates a text record with a bunch of information saying, Hey, I would, I, I am an external DNS instance running in this cluster with this specific identifier. I created and managed this record. So if you have multiple copies of external DNS, like we might have in production staging and what have you, they can all still service the same DNS zone and create and update records and they won't over overlap with each other because they'll have those text records saying who's responsible for managing rich record. Um, so that's pretty much the, the end of the demo. As I mentioned, I think the, the getting away from managing those pieces in Terraform, so you don't have to kind of, oh, if I want to deploy something in Kubernetes, I need to go and do a bit of Terraform and then do a bit of cludging around. All of it goes away. The other thing I think could be really interesting to think about from a delivery perspective is we can start creating ad hoc DNS. We can create ad hoc Kubernetes services of type load balancer with any DNS name we want which means we could start doing more interesting things like blue green deployments. We could be having completely separate Helm releases of like GitLab pods. We could have, you know, services that we set up easily with a full DNS record that we could then give to HA proxy to, to front end or all of that kind of stuff. Just being able to really quickly and easily generate DNS entries for any services we want in Kubernetes on the fly straight through the YAML, through the Helm release that you're doing to actually deploy those applications, I think could be really cool. I, I think it could, we could do some interesting stuff with that with Make Live. 
lives a lot easier in theory. <laughs> Cool. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks for the demo, uh, Graham. Yeah, uh, that's that's something we've been actually using. We've been using external DNS for cool. two years, I think now, in our oh, review cool. apps. Ah, right. So, yeah. cool. uh, that is the only way we met. Uh, there we go. Um, that, is, that was the only way we managed to Perfect. actually on demand generate uh, an environment that is reachable from the outside. So if you take a look at uh, the uh, section I highlighted here, yeah, yeah. this is where inside of GitLab, we actually pull in the external DNS and then we yeah, connect yeah, cool. it to our AWS uh, uh, wow. route, uh, route 53. 53? Oh, yeah. Route 53, yeah. Um, and we generate the um, the endpoint right there. And it actually works really, really well. I think mm. we had one problem with it at, uh, at the beginning where we generated so many that uh, AWS blocked us. Um, mm -hmm. So we kind of had to like, pare down and like uh, do some tricks around it. But um, I think this was a, a super old release. I don't think we upgraded this in a while. Uh, which means that it just works and it works really mm. well. So um, the interesting part here that you're mentioning about um, blue-green deployments, we can do that at GitLab only if we have a way to also highlight that um, the, the, the item that we are rolling uh, out doesn't have any changes to um, you know, like database. So that yeah, is the yeah. biggest, biggest problem. But there is a, a proposal uh, from the development um, that is currently in basically pre-pre-discussion stage of actually versioning um, or, or namespacing code changes as well. So you could say that, you know, this part of code depends on this database schema and this part of code depends on that database schema. And theoretically, that would allow us to run things in parallel, even when you have the, the database mm. uh, changes. So in combo with this, it would be great. But I think external DNS would be interesting for us um, in, uh, in other environments, not necessarily production, but definitely something like staging where we would be able to test things quickly. And when we get to the situation where the database can be easily uh, torn down and um, brought back, back up, we would be able to give more different environments to, to everyone actually to test changes. So I'm all up for this um, type of testing um, if you want to do it. Yeah, and I think even if it's not necessarily for the GitLab Helm releases, I think just like, like you saw my example with yeah. Prometheus, we've got more and yeah. more people spinning stuff, just small things up, and it's great to be able to say, oh, you don't have to go around and you know do this you know Terraform stuff or you know just... It's all there absolutely. in the one spot. You just ship it and away you go. Um, no, absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. No, that's a great, a great, uh, great demo, great idea, and I'm fully supportive uh, of it. So thanks for sharing. So I'll pull that up for review tomorrow, but I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to install it on all the clusters as part of the initial review in dry run only mode. So like just, just completely dry run, not doing anything special. And then I might do a, a mini readiness review kind of thing, or just a discussion at uh, DNA about like, like basically I want to make sure people like Hendrik and that who are very familiar with the DNS infrastructure, make sure there's no red flags or anything we need to watch out for. And, and then hopefully I just want to even use it for internal services, just gitlab.net, nothing gitlab.com. And then we can just start, you know, getting rid of a tiny bit more of complexity and moving a tiny bit more out of um, Terraform. We could probably use this for Plan 2 ML because that's relatively self-contained and it has a public DNS endpoint configured in Terraform. So after this is working internally, that would be a good place to use it. Would we be able to use it for registry? Currently, no, because the... Uh, the endpoint for registry is still using HA proxy, but I think we've been discussing the only reason we use HA proxy for registry is because of Canary, which uh, is doing, you know, request path based routing. There's no reason why we couldn't rig something up in Kubernetes that's similar, or I think we, we've talked about it. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, we don't have an issue tracking that. I'll, should, I'll, I'll open one, but we should probably get rid of HA proxy. And once we get rid of HA proxy, then 
yeah, it probably makes sense to manage DNS in Kubernetes. So does HAProxy talk to the the registry load balancer via DNS entry? Like yeah, how is that? It does. Yeah, okay. Not so we actually could not... even manage that that entry potentially, even with HAProxy in front of it. Yeah, it actually uses an IP address. It doesn't ah, even okay. use a DNS entry, but it could use a DNS entry. Um, it's not ideal. Like with HAProxy, you generally want to use IPs because okay. uh, you know if the IP changes, you have to reload HAProxy for that change to be propagated. Yeah. How does registry? How does registry use? How is Canary and registry involved? I thought registry was just a big blob of stuff. Yeah, I mean it's it's. It's a bit of a hack. We basically, uh, since we have, um, it's a layer, it's a layer seven uh, load balancer in front, so we're able to inspect the HTTP request path, and based on that, we route to either Canary or the main infrastructure. So if you do a registry, like a Docker pool on a GitLab or GitLab uh, com registry image, GitLab org or GitLab com registry image, then it uses the Canary pod. It does not get a lot of traffic though. We've thought about using weights uh, to shift a percentage of the traffic over to Canary. That's another option, but um, doing this in HA proxy seems a bit silly when the facilities already exist in Kubernetes to do this. So we could probably just get rid of the HA proxy layer at some point. And so that can, the registry Canary was, was just to get used to it when we were first because we didn't use to have a registry canary before Kubernetes, yeah. did we? Oh, Sorry, no, we did. We did. We did. <laughs> we always have, we always, well, not always, but we had a registry canary before. And we'll probably do the same thing for the front end when we migrate to Kubernetes. We'll, we'll create, we have a uh, canary namespace in Kubernetes, which uh, we'll test out first and we'll just serve GitLab org and GitLab com traffic to those pods for testing and then. Um, but I, I think eventually we'll probably consider, you know, doing something different. But this is what we have for now. And I think, like, thinking of doing something different as well, we have potentially other issues, right? Like, with things like Sidekick, for example, if you try and have, like, two sets of Sidekick pods running, do we have a way to say, hey, you, your Sidekick pods, you're running, but please don't do any work. We want we want someone else to do the work. Yeah, we don't have any, if you're talking about like a canary sidekick or having namespaces, uh, there's, um, there's kind of a longstanding issue for that. It doesn't exist. Uh, it's not something we can do currently because everything shares the same Redis uh, pool. There's no namespacing for Redis. So um, yeah, so that's not really possible for us to have a isolated set of sidekick workers. Without some investment in the application. Without some investment, yeah. yeah. And that issue is open for three and a half years now. Um, and I tried to escalate it a couple of times, but it was never a crucial part of our uh, workflow. So if we need to make it, if we can actually utilize it and do something about it, we can, uh, I can try again, but uh, I wouldn't hold my breath. Cool, but Graham, I think your approach, sorry, I got this, I disappeared for a tiny bit because I had to answer a phone call. Um, but I think your approach of starting something non GitLab application related first and like having that uh, work rock solid with external DNS um, is a good one. And then we can start thinking about these things on how we can uh, implement it inside of the application as well um, or to support the application as well. So uh, I, uh, I definitely encourage you to continue doing this. All right, do you wanna, did you go over the world work while I was uh, on a No, um, and, and awesome. I'm happy for, look, the bolt work is just more of a FYI if people are interested. If anyone's got anything else they'd like to cover in the meeting instead, I'm more than happy for them to do so. I'll take that as a no. In that case, what I might do is I'll very, very quickly just show the state of what I've done in Vault. It's actually not that difficult for me to just run through the more or less the, the code that's in the repo and the repo itself. It's not all pushed up there yet, but at least that should give people a kind of a clear view of how it kind of 
is put together at the moment and how it looks and you know if there's any discussion that comes out of that that would you know that would be great let me just find the screen button again is this the right one okay cool Um, so there's basically one kind of Git repo at the moment that all of Vault lives in, um, even though it does actually contain Terraform pieces for the infrastructure, Helm file pieces for the installation of Vault, and then more Terraform to actually configure Vault itself. Um, the project was done like this by um, Henry months ago, and it was mostly based off the idea from the security team who've been quite involved in this project, trying to see if they can we're trying to look at Vault, or they were trying to look at Vault as a way of, you know, being, because it's the keys to the kingdom, or it could become the keys to the kingdom, of isolating all of the bits and pieces to one repo so they could lock that down from a security and audibility perspective. So if you actually look at this repo, I'll show you inside the Terraform directory first. If we actually look at what this repo sets up, I'll try and get away with um, it's nothing too exciting. All we set up from the actual Google Cloud resources is we set up a service account. We give that service account some permissions. Um, we set up a, a KMS key ring that Vault uses to encrypt all its workload. And then the final thing we set up is essentially our network, our cloud NAT, and our GKE cluster. So Vault needs a minimum of five nodes and they recommend you have those five nodes with nothing else running on them from a security perspective once again. So basically all we do is we set up a Kubernetes cluster um, that actually has six nodes in it, which is, you know, it's one too many, but it's probably okay. Just that way we get a bit of extra capacity. Um, I am leveraging the latest version of the GKE Terraform module. So basically I am using that workload identity, so the service account we need for Vault, which talks to um, GKMS. Um, we don't need to put keys or generate keys or put them in one password. It all just works through um, GK, uh, GKE's workload identity. So that part is very simple. The Helm file part is even simpler. It's literally just one Helm file. If you look at the Helm file, um, I'm doing some ugly hacks to get a bunch of values out of Terraform itself. Um, but this here is basically just a normal installation of the Vault Helm chart. And everything you see on the screen now is more or less all the configuration that is needed, which is actually very simple. This used to be a lot more complicated because earlier versions of Vault, the storage engine was console and it had other storage engines like um, Google Cloud Storage, which is what we were using, but they weren't technically officially supported. As of Vault 1.4, the new version of Vault, uh, they now have an inbuilt storage engine that uses the Raft protocol. So really now configuring and installing Vault on Kubernetes is exceptionally simple. There's just about, there's about five pods. They use a PVC, PVC for their own data storage. They run in a service account that can get a GKMS key for encryption and decryption of that data. Um, and that's more or less all there is to it. The most interesting part, I think, to Vault, and there's and is the part we've barely scratched the surface on, is the uh, Terraform Vault part. So this is, once Vault is up and running, we've created the GKE cluster, we've created a service account, we've installed the Helm chart, it's all ready. How do we actually configure Vault itself? The big thing is um, things like auth methods. So this is all done in Terraform, even though it's um, not really infrastructure, simply because Terraform is a HashiCorp HashiCorp product, Vault is a HashiCorp product, so they recommend you use Terraform to set up and configure Vault as the first class citizen. Um, I won't go into all of this in detail because I could be here for hours, but things like configuring Vault backends, the policies, so who can access what, poli what particular thing, like an admin can access everything, but you know, GitLab people can only do certain things on certificates and all of this stuff is kind of, uh, more or less all um, encapsulated in there. And once again, that is just the start of a very deep hole that we go down. Um, I'm hoping over the next week to actually have that Vault instance up and running and like we could start doing very basic testing against it, even if it's only got very bare bones policies. Um, the other thing I'll point out is 
the integration pieces we have with Vault, which that with our current tooling, are quite nice. So for those of you who aren't aware, already right now, whenever you run a CI job uh, in GitLab, it generates a JSON web token, which we can directly validate against Vault, provided Vault has a couple of configuration tweaks to be correct, and essentially grant a policy, um, which is a set of secrets, to that job. So I'll link to the, the documentation. Um, let me just find it. Because it's a pretty interesting read. But essentially what that will allow us to do is when Vault is up and running, instead of having to set environment variables for secrets um, in CI jobs, we can basically just do a Vault login in the job itself using the Vault tool. And then any tool that needs to talk to Vault uh, can, can basically, that CI job is authenticated to all the secrets that we set the policy for it uh, to have access to. So that's really nice. And it makes things a lot easier. Let me see if I can find that documentation. Here we go. Uh, so I'll just pop that in the chat. In fact, I'll probably stop sharing my screen. So there's the, uh, the documentation for how GitLab at CI works with Vault. And the other thing I'll point out as well is our Helm file. So the Helm tool we use for, you know, basically deploying our Helm charts at the moment has a uh, built-in support for Vault as well. So all of those places where at the moment we do the really ugly shell hack of going to GKMS and um, GC GCS to get all of the secrets and decrypt them and everything, you can just replace with a line that looks something like this. Uh, basically, it looks like vault slash slash path to secret like that. So you can pop that straight into the Helm file. And when Helm file runs, as long as your current session is logged into vault and is valid, so like a CI job or like a user on their laptop, it will pull that secret down and populate it directly into the, into the location it is needed. So this will drastically clear up a lot of the really funny stuff we have relating to secrets in a lot of our Helm files. It'll make it nice and clean and simple once it's available. So that's probably the most useful benefits I see um, coming from getting Vault straight away or as soon as possible into this tooling. There is a bigger question, which I'm not sure if we're ready to think about yet about how we do secrets management with vault because it also has a vault injector which is basically another controller that can sit there and constantly pull vault and recreate secret objects when secrets change behind the scenes rather than binding it to our helm deploy process so it would mean we take away all of our secrets management out of all our helm files and we would just have this agent doing all the secrets management behind the scenes that changes a lot of the way we do things though. So I'm not sure if that's something we want to look at straight away, but it's an option for us down the road. Cool. There is one thing, um, I, I was not aware of the integration that we added with Vault. I, I know that we added something, I just didn't have the time to look at it. What's, uh, what immediately uh, jumps at me is that if we do authentication with Vault directly, uh do we have a way in policies in vault to tie users to a policy that is configured in the policies uh, file as in if we remove all of our secret variables that we currently have as environmental variables in uh, gitlab groups or projects um, theoretically then it doesn't really matter who has access to the project like at least internally, we don't really mind whether someone can see the code or not. We are open source in general. So the major problem we, ha we have with our permission system is that um, as when you're a maintainer or even a, a developer, you can easily print out secrets and then everything is out, right? So if you go this way, then you can't really do much. Um, you authenticate because we run the job in the context of the user it means that you can automatically authenticate with Vault and we can check you against the policies and like ensure that everything is kosher there. And then it doesn't really matter in which group the project lives and who has access because we have other ways of limiting changes to the code. We have approvals, we have, you know, like reviewers and so on that we can limit. And then as you, whether you're a developer or a maintainer becomes less 
less important. So yeah. that would be, I think, a big win for us. No, I think that's right. And so how it works is the CI job will get the JSON web token and go to Vault and say, this is my JSON web token. I am in this Git, GitLab instance. I'm running under th this project. And th like, this is a CI job under this project, under this GitLab instance. And Vault will validate that against GitLab's API and go, yes, that you are who you say you are. And then we tell, we tell Vault, okay, CI jobs under this namespace, under this repo can have these secrets. So you're right, we, we use GitLab as the control mechanism with like users and groups within GitLab, but we know that that CI job, once you, once you have access to a CI job on master because you're maintainer and you can merge to master or whatever, the, whatever we figure out the workflow is, we know that the, the user part is gone, yeah. So I don't know if that would really solve the problem, Aaron, because the problem we have now is not necessarily maintainers, but developers who can just, you know, cap the secrets in a CI job. I don't think this would change that, right? Because the job still has access to the secrets and the events. And even in this case, like, I don't know whether uh, masking works at all. Uh, it may not, which may be uh, a problem if we use this, right? Like this, like, cause secrets are automatically masked for CI variables in output. But in this case, maybe if you're not careful, they wouldn't be. Um, another but thing but is that it, yeah. But the difference, mm -hmm. Jarv, the difference is that right now we blanket give access to anyone who has the same role, right? Whether they can access it or not. With this change, you at least have that control of saying if you're not in the policies file, right? Like in this group, you can't even access the secret. And if you, if you, if you get added as a developer to a project, you immediately get access to it, whether you cut it or not. So I think what we have to be, so what this, I, I get what both um, Jav and yourself are saying. And I think what I would have to double check, the, the, probably the, the clearest way for me to articulate what we can and can't do would be to look at the contents of the JSON web token. So if we generate the JSON web token that GitLab itself generates, it does specify information like this is the GitLab instance, this is the project. If it specifies in that the, the user that caused this job to happen, then definitely on the vault side, we can validate that web token and use that because we know that web token is valid. We can say, okay, that information we can extract out of that. We give the policies. This user is, you know, this person, they've got access to this policies. If we don't have access to that in the web token, then Vault will be able to, we, we can have a policy for the job, but we won't be able to make any more clearer distinction from that, if that makes sense. So I think it'll really come down to the implementation. It's worth noting that they're also doing further improvements. So uh, Jav, what you mentioned about masking, they're getting masking support for Vault secrets. It's not there yet, you're right. It's actually not there yet, but it's coming. I've seen the issue and it's coming. So I think, as a first pass, I definitely wouldn't want to be using this like fully in production straight away, but I think it, it'll be good for us to start testing um, and seeing some of these problems. Cause I, even though they've added this to GitLab, I don't think anyone really uses it very much. So they think they'd be very interested in people trying it out. I think you would be surprised uh, how many people like using uh, this uh, edge super cool things. Um, yeah, so maybe I, I just, whenever I talk to them, they're always like, oh man, it'd be great. We had some, we've great. I mean, maybe people are using it and they love it and they don't get feedback. I guess they're, they're really looking for people to give them feedback, I guess. Yeah. So looking at the payloads, we do send user ID, user email. Like, so we have all of this information, which would be um, very beneficial, I think, for us. Jarrah, sorry, I interrupted you. You said another thing um, before I... Yeah. Um, so, so I guess there's, there's two ways we can use this. One is for CI variables and the other is for chef and Kubernetes secrets. And I would group those two together because the chef and Kubernetes, because I think we're gonna probably maintain the split for, you know, months, not weeks, you know, um, hopefully not years. But uh, so I would, I would say like between the two, I would rather focus on the chef and Kubernetes part, which would be to modify the shim we have for chef to source secrets from yeah. vault and then and then after we do that, then I think we can just integrate it with Kubernetes quite easily. Um, so maybe maybe the thing to do is focus focus on that first before we focus on the CI verse. Makes sense, and I think that's definitely 
the, the first focus once I get up and running to see if I can get rid of the horribleness of some of the Helm file stuff. So just, you know, pulling those secrets straight out. And then, yeah, I think definitely you're right. The next stage is figuring out how we can make Chef work with it. <laughs> Hopefully it's not too bad, but haven't had a close look yet. That makes sense. Um, go ahead. Uh, I've got diff different questions if you have. Um, what's the backup story like? Because I know... <laughs> I know all your poor work has been thrown away. I'm so sorry. Um, does, it, does it have a better story than we used to? Please. Yeah, tell me so at, at, at the moment, it's so now it's using PVCs, which are basically Google disks, like Google storage disks. So we just do snapshots. So we still need a backup job and I'm happy to, to write the job or whatever. And just basically now it just goes G cloud snapshot, a bunch of disks and Bob's your uncle and you restore them. You just restore those snapshots and bounce the pods. I think. Right. And that's, that's, got the same, that's got the same consistency story that the GCS backup yes. did, but so it's I, probably, I, probably slightly better. So I asked the HashiCorp people exactly this problem. It's like, okay, well like, do we need to like tell it to, you know, sync or, or whatever? And they're just like, oh, Vault doesn't write that much. You know, we've, we've been fine with... It. That's what they gave me for... That was the official HashiCorp response. So I was like, okay. Like, but yeah, unfortunately, we do need to change all that. But I think this this is better overall, I think, fortunately. So. Disk snapshot sounds like a whole much better than trying to do a, a task entire copy of a GCS bucket, which was always going to be risky. Yes. <laughs> we don't have to do it anywhere near the frequency we were just to get, the, to get some chance of a good backup. They're, they're very much like, don't back up, pay us lots of money for our replication and geo capability and, and just, you know, run it a billion places and therefore you'll never, you know, need to back up. That doesn't solve you from deleting things. Yeah, it's, well, <laughs> I think that. <sighs> Ray does not back up. Anyway, um, one other question. Um, where have you, so we've, I keep forgetting which Google project, GCP project we're running this in. There was InfraVault and GitLab Vault. Yeah. I, I have to go and delete one. So it's going to be GitLab Vault, I think. I'm going to delete the other one. I haven't yet just for some That's reasons, cool. but I'm going to go and clean that up. Very important then. Have you seen the spreadsheet for cleaning up Google projects? I did, but I'm lucky you just reminded me because I went through and, and cleaned up. My, I, I looked at my own, but I did not look at that one. So I probably should go and look at that one. I mean, it it's wouldn't have been the, if they deleted it, it wouldn't have been the end of the world, but yeah, I should go. Well, right, right now, now like, but... <laughs> To, to so, make it clear, we are not immediately deleting things. We are looking for owners first, and then we are going to contact the owners for the items that we want to delete and so on. Right? It's not going to be like flip the switch and delete GitLab production. Like, it doesn't work like that. That's, yeah, so cool. Um, but yeah, put a marker on that one. That'd be nice. Yeah, definitely. We should even do some, like even disk snapshotting backup wise, we should like, cause the data is going to be like only a hundred megs big or something. We should slurp the data off somewhere else as well. Like we, we should really, if it's going to be this important, which it probably will be, we should slurp that data somewhere else. Yeah. I'm, I'm just terrified of the idea that someone accidentally or literally deletes something out of the vault and then it's gone and your secrets are just not there anymore. And the recovery of that would just be a nightmare. Cool. Uh, we have a few more minutes. Does anyone have anything else uh, they'd like to share? Jar, would you like to share with uh, this audience um, the, the next steps with, uh, with Sidekick? We discussed this uh, already, but it would be nice to uh, share it with everyone here. Yeah, sure. So, um, um, well, there's... Uh, um, let me share my screen. I know that we're kind of going over here, so I'll be very fast. Um, so there's, a, there's an MR here to add um, tags to workers, and we're starting with a tag that says no disk IO. This will allow us to identify queues that don't depend on any disk IO. And um, you can see here, Sean, I think, just tagged all of the queues in the group. This is not... Um, this is not final yet. Uh, he left a comment that said he has to kind of go through these in detail with some code inspection to kind of see whether um, these queues rely on disk IO. And the reason why we're doing this is so for the next migration, we want to be sure that none of the workloads depend on shared storage. We have 
NFS mounts on our sidekick fleet for uh, cache and build traces. Um, this is like the archives and the builds mount point. And we really don't want to, um, you know, of course we're not, we really don't want to do those NFS mounts on Kubernetes. So we want to make sure everything we migrate doesn't depend on them. And the first pass of this is going to be, hey, let's just migrate all of the queues that don't depend on any disk IO. That should be easy. Well, we'll see how easy it is. I mean, we're going to spend some time doing some code inspection. Um, Sean said that he's going to um, maybe play around with local dev. I thought maybe the best way to go about this is to why not why not just create read only mount points on preprod for the shared storage like these directories and see if, if see if things run. I mean, obviously, like we do this on preprod, we do this on staging. If anything writes to these NFS mounts on a read-only volume, things should just crash or not work. Uh, so I thought about doing this, but then I saw in charts that we can't set volume mounts per pod. So I opened up an issue for that and we'll probably need to change charts to support it. But I think this is probably we want something we want anyway, because currently, um, if you didn't know that uh, like some, some workloads write to the shared directory, specifically project exports, and they use it as a scratch space. Like whenever you do a project export, they writes a very large tar file, sometimes large tar file to that directory before it uploads it to object storage. We don't want that empty dir for every single pod. Like we, we have it for project export, we have it for uh, memory, uh, but um, I think like moving forward, it's gonna be like, you know, for some Q groups, like we shouldn't have any, you shouldn't, you shouldn't need to write to the shared, the shared mount point at all. So um, I think we'll go ahead and do that. And then once we have that chart update, then I'll go ahead and make that change on pre-prod. We'll start tagging, you know, queues that we're going to migrate over and uh, we'll do some testing that way. Any questions about this? Do you expect to tag the queues sort of positively by name or would you sort of try and use the queue selectors and then exclude the ones that we know are bad? Yeah, so we'll use the queue selectors to take uh, a group of queues and then we'll use these, this tagging to, uh, you know, take a subset of the queue group. Um, so we'll, tags. Yeah, yeah, so we'll use, we'll just tag like, I don't know, like 10 queues at a time or something and the ones that were relatively certain don't rely on uh, you know, shared storage or any kind of IO. And uh, yeah, so that's how we'll do it. Cool, thanks Joe for sharing. Thanks uh, for the questions as well. Um, thanks everyone for the first APAC uh, demo. I hope the time was not too late for uh, Graham and Craig. Uh, if it is, we can tweak it a bit. Um, but I'm happy that we, uh, we are able to uh, share this with you as well. Um, and if we need to, we can increase the frequency and do like two times a month and then two times a month for, for the others, um, depending on what we have to show. But uh, let's take that offline, we'll discuss it. In any case, have a good Friday and the rest of the weekend and uh, see you next week. Bye.